The enemy still lacks one thing to give him strength and knowledge to beat down all resistance, break the last defenses, and cover all the lands in a second darkness. He lacks the One Ring. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we're finally taking a look at the history of the One Ring itself. Now I have made a separate video regarding the powers of the One Ring, and I've linked it and other articles and videos in the description and cards if you're interested. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. Forged in secret, in the fires of Mount Doom around 1600 of the Second Age of this Middle Earth, the One Ring was made to rule the 16 Great Rings forged by Celebrimbor and the other ringsmiths of Aregion. The One Ring was the final piece of a centuries-long plan by Sauron, the Lord of the Rings, who wished to dominate the bearers of the other rings and use that to control the world. Indeed, the One Ring, forged of a simple gold substance, held within it part of Sauron's spirit, will, and power, and it bore an inscription in Tanguar, which spoke the black speech of Mordor, proving that this was the One Ring, and only fire or the heat of Sauron himself could reveal this small poem. Sauron would be weaker without his ring, yet he could never truly die so long as the One Ring remained in the world, and the ring was so enticing that even the act to destroy it through one's will even in Mount Doom, was just about, if not entirely, impossible. The ring, though a perfect circle, could change shape to fit the bearer, and it was the power of Sauron in it that enhanced one's will to power, giving them strength and the will to dominate life. Sauron, once Myron, the servant of Aule the Smith, had powers in crafting greater than most other creatures in all of Arda. However, after Sauron forged his ring, his plan to conquer the Free Peoples in the Second Age, was nearly a success, but he came to realize that Celebrimbor had forged three other elven rings untouched by Sauron's malice, yet still subservient to his one ring. The elves who wore the rings realized Sauron's treachery as well, and felt him attempt to dominate their minds through the use of this new ring, and so they took their own rings off, and the three elven rings were sent away to be hidden by powerful guardians, so that they might retain their goodness. Sauron's plan had failed, at least somewhat, yet his ring and the others might still have been of use to him. Thus he made the war on the elves, both out of vengeance against them and to find the great sixteen rings that had been made through his instruction. While the one ring stayed with Sauron during this war, and he retrieved the sixteen from Aregion through conquest, the three elven rings would stay out of his grasp. Although he lost this war due to Numenorean influence, the retrieval of the other rings would certainly be a great boon in itself. Nine of these he would distribute to great kings, warriors, and sorcerers among men, three of whom were Numenorians. Seven he would give to dwarven kings of the seven clans, and through the powers of the One he would attempt to dominate the minds of these bearers with partial success. The nine men came under his control, becoming the Nazgul, the Ring Wraiths, while the seven dwarves became susceptible to their own greed and arrogance, which were magnified by their rings. Once again, the use of the One Ring only led to partial success, and Sauron, especially in the Second Age, had to continue to modify his plan of world domination and slaying those who stood against him. I go through his ever-evolving plans in a different video as well. The One Ring stayed in Mordor for a time, but in 3262 of the Second Age, King Arpharazon the Golden of Numenor came to Middle-earth and took Sauron as a prisoner back to the island, after the Dark Lord had incited his wrath. Once again, the Numenorean seemed too strong to conquer through open armies and warfare, especially away on their island. Yet Sauron, along with his ring, could do far more damage from within. Indeed, there's speculation in the fandom as to whether or not Sauron actually took the ring with him to Numenor when he was captured, or if he left it in Mordor, just as there's speculation as to whether or not Sauron held the Nine Rings of the Nazgul after corrupting them, or if the Nine held their own rings. However, it does seem that he took the One Ring with him to the island, as it seems that with the seductive powers of the Ring, Sauron was able to sway those Numenorians who were already falling into darkness of their own volition, the King's men and those who would be Black Numenorians. He rose from prisoner to the King's top advisor within a matter of decades, and again, likely with the power of the One Ring itself, he hastened the Numenorians towards their downfall. And their fall came swiftly. As in 3319, the army of Arpharazon went to and was trapped in Balinor, and the island of Numenor was drowned and destroyed by Iru Iluvatar. Sauron, who was actually on the island during its fall, was also drowned, and in losing his physical form, he would no longer be able to take on a fair form through shapeshifting. 
However, due to the One Ring, his spirit lost little of its potency, especially at this time. And somehow, he was able to take his ring back to Mordor, and perhaps it was carried by his spirit. Coming back to his home, Sauron, with his ring, made ready for open war against the West once more. Perhaps, since he yet retained the One Ring, it was actually far easier for him to take on another physical form than it would be in the Third Age, when the One Ring was lost to him. The Lord of the Rings launched his war, the War of the Last Alliance, and though he was against some of the greatest heroes of elves and men of all time, he still had his One Ring, and they could not use their elven rings against him, lest he dominate their minds with it. In the final battle of the war, Sauron fought against the High Kings of Men and Elves, Elendil and Gilgalad, yet even with all of his power and the use of his ring, he was beaten, though he still slew both of his opponents as well. A sealed door with the broken sword of his father cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand, and that would be the last time Sauron would actually ever have his ring, dealing the Dark Lord a major blow, one that would take thousands of years to even partially recover from, for in some ways he would never actually fully recover. Sealdor took the ring as a Wurgild, or blood trophy, for the deaths of his brother Anarion and father Elendil. Yet one of the ring's failsafes worked, as Sealdor could not actually destroy the ring, nor did he want to, though he was on the very slope of Mount Doom itself. No, in his arrogance, just as Sauron would have done in a Sealdor's place, the new, arrogant High King of Men took the ring for his own. Sauron's will was still at work, and perhaps if a Sealdor had not been slain in the year two of the Third Age and the ring was lost, it actually could have done far more damage to the realms of men and elves. But because Isildur lost the One Ring in the Gladden Fields, and perished because of it, the most powerful relic in Middle-earth at that time stayed hidden in the Anduin for thousands of years. And since Sauron had not the One Ring, the three elven rings could be used without fear. Perhaps with its small and restrained autonomy and will, the One Ring had intended to be picked up by an orc or Nazgul and returned to its master as even with the strongest and greatest river in Middle-earth pushing against it, the ring never came out to sea. It could be that other forces held it in place instead, knowing that good folk would come to live there and it could be returned to the world of the Free Peoples rather than lost to time. But either way, while fishing in 2463, the Stuar Hobbit, Deagle, was pulled into the water by a great fish and found this golden ring on the riverbed. No amount of water could wash away Sauron's malice, however, and Deagle's cousin Smeagol murdered him and took the ring for himself, being already corrupted by it. With him, the One Ring went deep into the Misty Mountains for centuries, and as Sauron returned to Dual Guldor and grew again in power, planning to either find the ring with his servants or conquer the world without the One Ring, another unlikely creature would come into contact with the One. After being misplaced by Gollum, Smeagol, the One Ring was found by Bilbo, who was accidentally dropped by a dwarf friend. And the One Ring came closer to bearers who would not hold it for as long as Gollum or Sauron, and those who would be, in the end, less corrupted by it, taking the Ring closer to its doom. But as for Bilbo, he would use the Ring, just as Smeagol and Isildur had, yet he would accomplish great deeds in helping the dwarves reclaim their mountain home with it, rather than simply using it for only selfish reasons. The ring would return with Bilbo to the Shire, being the furthest from where it had been forged since it had returned from Numenor. Bilbo would hold on to it for decades in the Shire, using it for his own from time to time, as it benefited him in avoiding pesky relatives in the Shire. But eventually Bilbo grew weary in his heart and wished to leave his homeland. Gandalf, who had been sent to Middle-earth millennia before to combat the Shadow of Sauron, convinced Bilbo to leave the ring behind for his nephew. Frodo, who was younger and less corrupted by the One Ring. Gandalf, who knew the ring was safe in the Shire for a time, also knew that Sauron had returned to Mordor, and Gandalf became interested in this ring and Gollum and the tale of its past. For years, Gandalf spent time doing things such as researching the old scroll of Isildur in Minas Tirith. He sent his friend Aragorn to hunt for Gollum, and Gandalf even talked with the creature after Aragorn had found him. And he finally put together the tale of the ring and it was proven to him that Bilbo's ring was the one, as, when put in the fireplace of Bag End, it revealed the Tanguar of Sauron's language, put there nearly 5,000 years before by the Dark Lord. Before Frodo set off on his adventure, Gandalf, in the book, had actually touched the ring, but only for a moment, and did not seem affected by it. Of course, shortly into his adventure as well, Tom Bombadil 
would show that the ring had no power over him, being also unaffected by it. However, I would not count these two as ring bearers, but it is important to note that they did touch it. Thus, Frodo was set off on his adventure after learning a great deal about the ring, and it became clear how many factions, people, and forces desired to have the ring. While primarily the Nazgul, Sauron's chief servants, looked for it, Gondor and likely some others would have wanted to use the ring against Sauron directly, yet the wise knew this to be folly. Others, like Saruman and his faction of Isengard, had actually been searching the Anduin Fort for a time and wished to possess it. Yet at Rivendell, where the ring was taken by Frodo and his friends, it was decided that it should be destroyed. And so the primary events of the Lord of the Rings books occurred, with the One Ring, the Master Ring, a sealed door's bane at its center. Frodo the Ringbearer, who used its invisibility with greater repercussions than Bilbo had on his journey, took it towards Mordor, and his fellowship gave way after Boromir attempted to take the ring from him. Yet Frodo continued with his closest friend Sam. Gollum, who also wanted the ring back and hunted for Frodo, joined them and betrayed them along the way. As they made their way closer to Mount Doom and the ring's destiny, the ring clearly affected Frodo more and more. And after it seemed that Shelob the Spider killed Frodo, Sam bore the ring for a time, using it on the very outskirts of the Dark Land. But Frodo had survived and was saved. And Sam, like Bilbo, was one of the only people to give up the One Ring of his own volition. With some persuasion from a friend, of course. Frodo continued to carry it to Mount Doom, while Sauron, who still only had a weak physical form, turned his eye and armies towards Gondor and Aragorn, whom Sauron believed was the new ring bearer. For if Sauron was in Aragorn's position, his will to power would have put the ring in his possession. Especially with Aragorn being the heir of Isildur who made that mistake himself. Yet, this was the folly of Sauron, and in the Dark Lord's arrogance, Frodo and Sam, and Gollum who followed behind, made it to Mount Doom, where Sauron had once made the ring in the attempt to dominate the minds of many during the age before. Frodo, however, could not destroy the ring voluntarily, as it finally overcame his will and mind, dominating him. Yet the failsafe of the ring worked against itself, as Gollum also wanted the ring back, and even as Frodo wore it and the Nazgul made their way to the Mountain of Fire, and Sauron knew the peril of his ring, Gollum reclaimed it, but slipped into the fire incidentally. The ring came to ruin, as did the spirit within it, the spirit of Sauron, who would be banished and too weak to ever return to the world again. Gollum accidentally destroyed his precious, and accidentally saved the world. Although Sauron surely could have taken the world through conquest if given enough time, for there was little strength compared to the people of the Second Age that could oppose him. If he had gotten the ring, his victory would have been certain. This ring which had wrought so much destruction in the near 4,867 years it was around was finally gone. Yet those who had possessed it, and yet lived, did retain some scars from it with Sam having had it for the least amount of time amongst all the ring bearers, and therefore retaining the least amount of pain from it. And so Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam were all given places in Valinor to live out the rest of their days. And while Bilbo and Frodo left at the end of the Third Age, Sam would join them eventually. Without the One Ring, the other rings, even the good Elven Three, lost their powers, and much good and evil faded from the world. And so we come to the end of our tale about the One Ring. From the story of the One Ring, we see that temptation for power and ambition may seem intriguing or even helpful at times, but we should rather stay true to ourselves and each other, and to do deeds we know to be good for the world instead. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this Artifacts of Arda video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on the One Ring? Let me know in the comments below. The powers of the ring and how they impacted different moments in the story are so incredible. Indeed, the questions the characters were forced to ask themselves and the choices they made when the One Ring was involved really make moments in The Lord of the Rings as intriguing as they are. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Kyle Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putin, and Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Matt Sabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolik, Brandon Glidden, Molly Sullivan, Daniel Burns, Anthony Harmon, Dorwin Gray, Arthur and Merlin. Thank you all so much and thanks to all of our patrons and YouTube members. The support means the world to me. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a video on the mouth of Sauron and who he might have been. You all are the best, my friends. Thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.